at 7.55 a.m. December 7, 1941, the United States Naval Base known as Pearl Harbor, located in Oahu Island in the Pacific Ocean, was attacked by the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service. The attack took place Sunday, especially chosen for surprising the base unguarded, as most of the soldiers and officers were off duty during the weekend. And still, there were several clues that an attack was imminent. The most important of all was the radar signal that the privates Joseph Lockhart and George Elliott received on the Oahu radar station on that Sunday morning. Lockhart announced this to Lieutenant Kermit Tyler. I got a call at 7.15 or thereabouts from the radar operator. They had a huge blip indicating a large number of airplanes. He replied a big lie, namely that the plane formation that was heading to Pearl Harbor was American one. So as I sized all this up, I thought, uh, it has to be the B-17s. And so I said, don't worry about it. I said, don't worry about it. 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 If the base would have been alerted right after that information, many lives were saved. Prior to this attack, there were hostile relations between Japan and the United States, which resulted in an economic embargo on oil and steel for Japan. The negotiations between the two sides were finished without any result. As Japan attacked some near countries during that period, a Japanese attack on the United States was very probable. In the face of existing conditions, we have no choice but to expand our program of armament construction to a degree necessary to provide fully adequate means of defending this country's security and its rightful interests. It has to be the B-17s. And so I said, don't worry about it. For his neglect, under normal conditions, Lieutenant Tyler should have been sent to court and convicted. But not only that he was never investigated, but he was even decorated after the war with a lot of distinctions, including the Legion of Merit. I got rapid promotions. I was made a captain in April of 42, and then a, a major in June, the following two months, and then a year later I was a lieutenant colonel. How is that possible after such an enormous error? Don't worry about it, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. The 19th century industrialists' greed became so big that the workers' schedule in factories was longer than eight hours per day. People were upset. In reply, the industrialists tried the same tactics of 18th century industrial revolution golden age. 
namely firing the unhappy workers and replacing them with the peasants lured from the agriculture lanes. The only problem was that in the 19th century there were fewer peasants left and many unhappy workers. The workers rise into riots as the ancient slaves. In 1886 in Chicago, there was a big and bloody worker strike that eventually gained no more than eight hours per day work. But the unhappiness remained on as this particular strike was bloodily pressed by the police who fired the strikers after previously a bomb exploded in the area. Then the industrialists tried another tactic, namely provoking a provisory crisis, enough to close their factories and move to another places where people were happy to work hard and bring profit to them. The biggest crisis of all took place in 1929, known as the Wall Street Crash. The money quickly lost their value and people lost their fortunes. Many committed suicide. The economic theorists stated that this crisis was caused by the stock market unrealistic speculations. But behind it, there were the richest 19th century industrialists' benefits. They were the descendants of the 18th century industrialists who, after several generations, became so rich that lost contact with the common people and with the sympathy for the humankind. They transformed from the factory's owners into bankers. In the late 19th century and the beginning of 20th, the bankrupt clients' enforcement became a more successful business than owning a factory. During those crises, the bankers keep becoming richer and richer on the common people's behalf, which got poorer and poorer. The people then developed hating feelings toward the richest, which eventually turned into other radically opposed form of social inequity politics. One of them was the communism, mainly developed by the German philosopher Karl Marx from the middle of 19th century. He stated that the only way to balance the social injustices was the workers rising up, gaining the power, and creating the proletariat dictatorship. Marx thought that the workers must unite and destroy the entire bourgeoisie legacy, prey on their goods and develop their own society without capitalistic greed. The communism was a radical ideology that theoretically denied every social stratification stated, including the feudal one. That was an utopian and even hypocritical claim, as in the second half of the 20th century, the communist countries developed their own social classes based on propaganda demagogy. These classes reflected the high specialization occupations and the low jobs. The communist was mainly popular among peasants who needed this political ideology for escaping the feudal society chains. Those who experienced the 18th century industrial revolution golden age didn't support the communists as the peasants did. They knew from that time that there is the industrialists skills and knowledge that make a successful business as the common people can't. That's why the high-quality factories that the communists stole from the rich ended up into producing obsolete products under the politically coined management. This is what the Western society experienced in the 18th century as the East European communists once experienced it in the last 20th. So, for the most of the 19th century Western people, the solution was going back not so deep in the past into the primitive commune, as communism stated, but only one century ago, when the rich ones weren't so greedy and so heartless. It is the no banking system capitalism, which at that time meant no Jew capitalism. The anti-Semitism was old in Europe due to usury practiced mainly by the Jews in the Middle Age as the Judaic religion accepted it. On the contrary, the Christianity not only that rejected it but also vehemently condemned it as the new form of slavery. 
During that period, a large number of books were written on the injury subject, condemning it from moral, religious and political points of views. After many centuries of condemning usury, there were two ways to accept it by the majority. The first one was absorbing the usury practice into a crucial institution for the new industrial era, namely the banking system. The Middle Age criticism on usury was based on its similarity with the slavery or robbery. The usurer gets undeserved profit out of somebody else's work, just like the slave owner or the robber. During that time, the lives of those who couldn't pay back the usurer were destroyed. Although taking money on loan was meant to get out of a difficult problem, most of them ended up trapped into a bigger one after taking that loan. That's the clue for the social turmoil that came up and eventually exploded into anti-Semitism in the previous centuries. But the industrial era and the banking system came with a new opportunity. Absorbing usury into the banking system is like a commercial that associates the product with a positive thing, person or idea. The banking system usually has changed its name into banking interest and that was like a promise that this time the usury clients will be happier than they were in the middle age. The second way to accept usury painted into the interest optimistic colors was lowering the payback value. By this strategy, it was easier for the loaner to pay back the interest and not to reach the bankruptcy. Thus, many loaners have had developed personal successful businesses from the loans they previously took. Those stories became quickly popular among those who hoped to get rich one day. That was the root of the later called American Dream. And this dream was so huge into so many common people that they eventually forgot about the usual old problems, especially now when its name has changed into interest. The Rothschild dynasty can be credited with implementing this modern banking system of lending money. Until the Rothschilds, the banking system was reduced to securing payments being secondary to trade or value secure depositing. From that point, lending money became the most practiced action of a bank in the modern era. But even if the payback interest percent was lower than the middle age usury, eventually some loaners went broke and the old usury problems came back once more. The hatred feelings toward the rich bankers exploded. Although in 19th century there were many Christian bankers, the Jews were pointed at for the social inequity, once again giving the example of the Judaism religion that accepted usury from the very beginning. After many hundreds of years from that period and after so many writings against usury, now we understand it was wrong, but condemning the entire Jew population for it was a bigger mistake because not all the Jews practiced it. The Judaism was that journal to put the blame for the 19th century wild capitalism on the common Jew, although the common Jew never practiced usury, and its cultural acceptance was a matter of ancient times, when the benefits percent wasn't so big and greedy. But the human psyche usually finds a way to split a situation into the bad and the good side and the Jews were so unlucky to be blamed for the wild capitalists accepted and hated by the entire population. Hating the Jews for the heartless social system was a way to save the good image for the capitalism and project the bad image outside into a marginal community. The anti-Semitism was that deep mind compromise between retiring to a traditional way of life and hard working for making a high standard living. But the Russian family was rightly accused for that due to the immense wealth that he gained since the end of 18th century. The first family bank was founded in Frankfurt, Germany by Meyer Amstel Rothschild. 
The Rothschild dynasty later on developed in the major European cities such as London, Vienna or Paris where it controlled the local banking system among the most profitable businesses. For almost a century, the Rothschilds were the richest people in the world until the American bankers and industrialists like John D. Rockefeller and G.P. Morgan came up. So, being Jews, the Rothschilds were the number one target of the new anti-Semitism. The third ideology was not focused on the economical and political struggle. Its main characteristic was not engaging into either one of them. It was not a genuine ideology, but more like a, a way of life, namely the Middle Age living style. The people who adopted it were the peasants. Some of them remained on the lands after the traditional land owners left their properties and moved to the cities to start industrial businesses. Others were disappointed workers that decided to go back where their grandfathers left a century before. The atheistic wave in the Western society gave them an unexpected advantage in front of the old landowners who allowed the Christianity with their caste interests. If there was no God, then there was no divine right as well that the feudal aristocracy ideologically based on. So the peasants demanded their own lands from those who had so much that couldn't work it by themselves alone. However, many landlords eventually gave up the agriculture for industrial businesses in big cities, so the peasants could claim these lands for free. All of these three ideologies were against the 19th century capitalist profit. The first two wanted a soft and softer capitalism. The third one totally rejected the capitalists living a traditional way of life. These three barriers were not specific to Europe only. The United States dealt as well with them in their history. The anti-Semitism was so popular in the United States that even the big industrialists like famous Henry Ford supported it. Although this ideology was against his very own social status, but Ford didn't even know that. He became a rich man during his lifetime and previously noticed the banking system unfair practices. He was a common man before getting rich and experienced on his own scheme these negative 19th century wild capitalist actions. That's why Harry Ford never discriminated the Jews and hired them in his factories like everyone else in spite of his anti-semitic political views. Hitler mentioned him in good terms in his famous book Mein Kampf and has kept a picture with him in his office. But there were not clear evidences that Ford really supported Nazi coming to power, as it has been said, although he clearly sympathized with them at first. And there were many like him in the Western countries. Rejecting the 19th century capitalist banking system practices meant fighting the riches of all. So the anti-Semitism was an ideological danger for the top richest community. The communist ideology was also popular in the United States. For stopping it through movies, in Hollywood was set up the so-called House Un-American Activities Committee. It functioned as a new inquisition for every anti-capitalistic ideology that Hollywood might have had spread through movies. Every newscast, even newsreels, was blazing the news that Hollywood movies were filled with secret communist propaganda and there was a panic in the industry. After the World War II, 151 Hollywood artists who hated capitalists were temporarily excluded from film plans or other Hollywood projects based on their unofficial political views. This is known as the famous Hollywood blacklist or Bill's list. Screenwriters like Delton Trumbo, the well-known actor Kirk Douglas, or the actress Catherine Hepburn, they were booked in it. Some of them had indeed communist political views, 
but many were anti-political in the sense that they did not support either capitalism or communism, but a life of freedom, just like the traditional farmers. Something had to be done. We flew to Washington to tell the people, the movie-going people, movies are still safe. We're not interested in communism. The third anti-capitalist ideology was involved in the famous American Civil War between the industrial North and the traditional South. In the first half of the 19th century, the official version of this war was that the industrialized North cared so much about the South black slaves that risked their own lives to set them free. But in fact, that was a false pretext. If the northern industrialists would really care for these people, then they should release them back to their origins, Africa. On the other hand, the United States society proved not paying much attention to unprivileged people, as it has one of the highest homelessness rates in the world. The American Civil War had another main purpose, namely converting the classical slaves traditionally specialized in agriculture work into the factory workers. In the same time, the southern slave owners had to step up their businesses from agricultural into industrial to maintain their social privileges. The illusion of freedom was the main tool for this social conversion, as the industrial workers lost more important freedoms that gained after escaping classical slavery. The freedom to work or not, the freedom to leave the production base and to choose one's life partner, were paid with more than eight hard work hours in the early industrial age factories. That's why, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th, in the United States as well as in Europe, there aroused an anti-capitalistic wing. And to counterbalance these ideologies, the rich ones were preparing a big war. This war was meant for both frightening the world workers to work harder, but also to disinformationally dismantle all these three ideologies that were standing against the richest maximum profit. As concerning the profit that the worst bring to the richest, the Second World War left us the clearest examples of how the economy skyrocketed during those horrible times. According to public data on the evolution of the American economy, once the war started in Europe in 1939, the US GDP grew from a deficit of minus 3.3% in 1938 to 8% increase in 1939, 8.8% .8 in 1940, 17.7% in 1941, 18.9% in 1942, 17.0% in 1943, again 8.0% in 1944, and then again a deficit of 1% in 1945 and minus 11.6% in 1946 when the war ended and the budget suffered drastic reductions. The rich industrialists with their profit mentality are addicted to wars as the classical slavery is addicted to threats on the slave to work harder. The bigger the threats, the more profitable business is. The main difference between the classical slavery threats and the modern threats is that the first ones are directly pointed on the slaves as the second ones are randomly pointed on the connected workers area. Then the workers perceive these threats as all threats to their own lives. That's why the economic growth coincides with wars escalating that scare the nearby population. Although the industrialists geographically live in the different countries, they live in the same country as a cast interest. They are much more emotionally closer to their cast from different geographic countries than are to their own people. 
that's why they contributed in creating and sustaining wars between their own nations, making sure that if they win the war, they won't charge or convict the other industrialists from the so-called enemy country. In this documentary, we will see plenty of examples of key persons in escalating wars that either weren't prosecuted or weren't actually punished for their crimes that led to thousands or even hundreds of thousands dead. The capitalist way of trading with the clients as well as of dealing with the ideological enemies is done with the same informational weapons mechanism, the advertising. This manipulation technique is mainly known for its ability to uplift the market value of a product by artificially associating it with a valuable idea, person or object. But besides that, there is the denigration technique, which is the commercial ads reverse. It consists in artificially associating something with a negative idea, person or object in order to make a bad image into the public's eye opinion. This was the way the richest industrialists fought with their enemies. The capitalist mentality main difference from the feudal one is its ability to hide wealth, interests and political actions in the society. In the same way, it instilled the war, in the sense that someone else should be blamed later in the aftermath for starting it. The logistic was set, the only problem was which one of those three ideologies should be frontally attacked. The traditionalist peasant's mentality could be secondary attacked by a possible war itself as a collateral image. The communism was not such a danger for the richest capitalists, as it was popular mainly among philosophers and agricultural countries, but the anti-Semitism was. So the plan was to both create the war from behind the curtain and blame the anti-Semitist regime for that. Hitler and his Nazi party was the perfect target for this purpose working from behind the scenes to get Nazi to power and then making them the only responsible for a humanitarian catastrophe was the perfect way of creating this denigration. Every anti-19th century capitalist person would feel conflicted and self-blaming for its political views that contributed to Nazis achieving power. That was one of the biggest manipulation masterpieces in the humankind history. Those who were against the 19th century wild banking system capitalism were simply shut down and disinformatively poisoned with their own guilt after this catastrophe. Besides boosting the Western economy, the second important purpose of the war was to sacrifice a good portion of the Jewish population in order to counter the anti-Semitism that the Rothschild dynasty as a Jewish family was facing throughout the Western countries and particularly in Germany. The Holocaust that followed changed the anti-Semitism into compassion that this dynasty took full advantage of it. By this huge mass manipulation machinery, the smallest criticism on the banking system and the 19th century wild capitalism was associated with the anti-Semitism. The first problem for achieving this goal was that Hitler and Nazis simply couldn't get the power in Germany all by themselves if it wasn't for a large amount of support from outside. The traditional anti-Semitist Germany turned even more anti-Semitist after the 1929 big crisis. But still, that wasn't enough to bring Hitler to power and start a war. In April 1932, Rano for presidency, Hindenburg won 53.0% of the votes and Hitler only 36%. Only Nazi party won the elections, mostly with almost 44% in March 1933. But that was not enough to create a majority in the German Reichstag, as there were other parties that shared the rest of the votes. 
In normal circumstances, neither Hitler nor Nazi could have gained power, as all the parties could make a coalition that easily could have gotten it in the democratic way. Everyone was afraid of losing the status, as Hitler's main interest was to bring Germany into dictatorship. To reach the power and impose the dictatorship in Germany, he was strongly sustained by others. The marketing openly recognizes that the advertisement is the heart and the soul of the commerce. As the companies have advertising teams that make good publicity campaigns, in the same way it is done the negative advertising, the denigration. It is made by a huge secret institution that works as a civil espionage. It first gathers information from the public opinion and then creates this information and public events that works exactly like advertising, namely influencing the public opinion free choice. Many public statements about the US big industrialists supporting Hitler to power or Nazi infiltration after the war into American politics are false. Most of them are specially made by the civil espionage disinformational institution to cover up and denigrate the true ones. For example, the idea that John D. Rockefeller's famous company, Standard Oil, helped Nazi Germany to extract synthetic gasoline out of the coal is false. The US Supreme Court's decision from 1911 split Standard Oil into several other companies, among which the biggest company in the world right now, ExxonMobil. So it's impossible to find genuine data that incriminates Standard Oil in supporting Nazis, as it no longer existed in the 1920s. But after the World War II, several such genuine documents that pointed on the biggest world industrialist support on Hitler and Nazi were accidentally found. People found and published them as were well working for the global civil espionage to keep them secret. If the Rockefellers of Standard Oil support for Nazi Germany information is false, his support for Hitler's accession to power with his Chase National Bank is true. The fact that his older son, David Rockefeller, who was the chairman and chief executive of Chase Manhattan Corporation, sustains this. Changing its name to Chase Manhattan Bank, Chase Manhattan Corporation, or today's Chase Bank, just like Standard Oil was renamed ExxonMobil, won't be able to hide the fact that when it was named Chase Manhattan Bank, this bank publicly admitted and apologized for doing business with Nazi Germany. The financial supply continued even after the US was officially at war against Germany. So literally, Standard Oil couldn't support Nazi Germany as no longer existed. But symmetrically, with these chase formulas, that information might be true if instead of Standard Oil, we read ExxonMobil. Several documents show that Hitler was eventually brought to power from a petition signed by the big German bankers and industrialists like Fritz Thyssen, Hanmar Sack, Wilhelm Kepler, and many more. This petition was signed by the German industrial community and then addressed to Germany's democratically elected president Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as chancellor. This petition was crucial for Nazis and Hitler coming to power, in spite of losing elections as the individual and Nazi failing to make a majority in Reichstag. Fritz Thyssen was the biggest money supplier for Nazi electoral campaigns. He was the main Nazi regime founder, as later admitted into his autobiography book, I Paid Hitler. He was one of the richest men in Germany, with businesses in mining and steel industry, and of course in banking. He led the Association of German Iron and Steel Industrialists. Besides that, he inherited the Bank for Handel and Schwepart, a Dutch bank founded by his father August Thyssen. He expanded its business area into the United States by founding the Union Banking Corporation in 1924, 
by associated with the Brown Brothers Harriman Bank. This bank was a money channel supply from United States to Nazi Germany. The connection person between these two banks was through Prescott Bush, the father and grandfather of the 41st and the 43rd US presidents, who ran himself into electoral campaigns and was elected for US Senate from Connecticut in 1952. Through this association with Brown Brothers Harriman, the richest Americans sent massive support for the Nazi regime to gain power in Germany, and thus instilled a world war for the later worldwide economy profit. Supporting the Nazis was like building an entity meant to later absorb the entire guilt for the disaster that was about to happen. The support for the Nazi empowering was so big at first that even the Associated Press fired some Jew journalists and collaborators in order to keep low the anti-Nazism in the United States. The journalist Louis P. Lochner was the Associated Press correspondent in Berlin. He was in very close connection with the top Nazi figures, like we see in this picture with no other than Hermann Göring the second man in Nazi party after Hitler. In 1939, Lochner won the Pulitzer Prize for his activity and didn't return after the war in the USA from Germany, where he died in 1975. With a very deep sense of understanding of what was going on in those days in Germany, the political activist and visual artist John Hartfeld cartooned Fritz Thyssen as Hitler's puppeteer. This reaction from a part of the public opinion was threatening the efficiency of the world social engineering of associating the 19th century anti-banking system capitalism with a huge humanitarian catastrophe that was instilling. To disinformationally contract this possible spreading the idea into the whole society, and also to protect the Nazi financially supporters. Later on, when the table turned, there came up a radical change in their behavior. That happened with Chen's National Bank, or the Union Banking Corporation, that was terminated right after the war in Europe started. The sign of that kind of invest instigation disaster and then retreating from it, it is noticeable in the Fritz Thyssen's later bizarre behavior specific to the infiltrated spies into a community that I described in detail in my previous documentary called The Diversionists. After financially and ideologically supporting Hitler war politics that he clearly exposed from the very beginning, Wiesen suddenly switched from that and criticized the invasion of Poland. After this strange radical change of opinion, he was eventually arrested for treason and then released by the allies in 1945, just like Hadamar Sack, the other important division organizer that made Hitler chancellor. We must understand the amplitude of this radical behavior switch from the Nazis themselves, who saw them as traitors. That psychological and behavior inconsistency move is not genuine for a businessman with a family tradition and gaining profit. Common people sometimes behave contradictory, thus blocking themselves from success. The bipolar disorder, the histrionic disorder, and other several mental disorders have contrary and bizarre symptoms, so the person who suffers from them turns from one behavior to a totally different one. Also, a person who suddenly becomes very religious, radically changing its way of life and thinking, like the biblical figure Maria Magdalena. But it is not a case with Fritz Thyssen. He remained the same person that he was before the war, and the penitence he later expressed in interviews and autobiography were fake, just like his Nazi supporting from the very beginning. Fritz Thyssen was just a tool for the worldwide banking and industrialist community, namely that time capitalism, for creating a war from behind the curtain. 
The rich industrialists simply wanted to gain more profit for the world's economy by eliminating the three common people's mentalities that stood against it, namely the previously mentioned anti-Semitism, communism, and the free traditional peasants. Supporting the anti-Semitic Nazi was a very smart way to fight the anti-Semitism and communism that stood in the richest way to get richer. Beside the previous mentioned profit gain from the world terror created into the common people, it was even a smarter way to get rid of anti-capitalism and further on to scare the peasants out of their lanes into the big cities. Having the freedom of living in the nature but not having the tools to protect from the world terror, the peasants largely sought out shelter in the big cities and left their traditional homes. In this way, they were collected into the global industrial economy. This happened not only with the big world wars, but also with the smaller wars that followed, like Yugoslav, Iraqi, and Syrian wars. These wars, refugees became the cheap labor force in the Western economies. Some people understood that social engineering a century ago. This cartoon made by John Hartfield with free station controlling Hitler was an informational danger of fulfilling the war instilling hideous plane. If this idea would have become popular among common people, then the entire plan of war instigation failed. So Thyssen's radical switch from the Nazi regime monist flyer to dissident was only meant to counteract this idea into a disinformation for public opinion. If he suddenly changes themes, then he will later on find an alibi out of the disaster aftermath for his innocence. As for the world riches, elite false innocence as well in generating the World War II. Supporting the Nazis at first just enough to give them the power could be interpreted as a sign of patriotism and love for Germany, who was stuck by both the World War I compensations as a defeated country and also by the 1929 disastrous economical crash. In the same time, vehemently opposing to the war is meant to cut off any connection between him and the disaster that was about to happen, and pointing all the guilt on the Nazis in the public opinion's eyes. This fake psychological inconsistency might make no sense for the individual person, but had a crucial role in the success of the entire World War II social engineering eugenic economic experiment. That kind of sudden radical change in action is typical for infiltrated spies that instigate an action and then abandon it after the others took charge of it. If his action is not logical at the appearance level, it is very coherent in the disaster instigation dynamics. It is commonly practiced by the local and the international civil espionage agencies that infiltrate their agents in the movements, gatherings, and riots. Their role is to gain trust from these small communities and then to attract them into ideological and political traps, as I've shown in detail in my previous already mentioned documentary, The Diversionists. This sudden change of political view from Nazi regime supporter and sustainer into its critic was just enough for Tessa to avoid conviction after the war was over, with only two years in prison during the war. He also was prosecuted after the war, but in the end was only fined with 15% of his enormous wealth. Well, this kind of action is similar to the way the United States treated Lieutenant Kermit Tyler, who didn't report or was intentionally misinformed about the radar signal of a strange plane formation that was heading towards Pearl Harbor. Instead of being prosecuted, he was decorated. Or if someone from the upper layers of military hierarchy lied to him about those planes, then he should have testified about it in a trial. But of course, now we realize that at the other end of that command chain, there were the big industrialists and bankers all over the world 
the ones who maximally profit from the wars. They wanted the biggest possible damage at Pearl Harbor, for later justifying the war as a defensive one. These kind of strange acquittals of key persons in generating the mass murders is the common pattern of instigating them, including the Pacific side of World War II, as we will see later in this documentary. Mother of coincidence, Hapmar Sachs' destiny was exactly like Fritz Dessen's. In 1934, Hitler appointed him in charge of the Minister of Economics. After the failed plot on Hitler in July 1944, he was arrested by Gestapo for treason, although he was also a main figure in empowering Nazi in the first place. He was released by the Allies in 1945 after Germany's capitulation. And exactly like Thyssen, instead of being considered a hero, as we might expect, he was charged but not convicted by the International Military Tribunal from Nuremberg. After this, he was charged again and convicted to eight years of prison in West Germany, but eventually he was acquitted and in 1953 founded a bank. Hapmar Sack traveled to the United States in 1905, where he met one of the world's largest bankers, J.P. Morgan, and Theodore Roosevelt himself, that would later become the United States President. As you say, I have been here rather often, since 1905. And as you may remember, my parents were married in the city of New York, where my father used to become an uh, American citizen. My elder brother has been born in New York. So I feel almost half of a New Yorker. <laughs> he also was a very close friend with Montago Norman, the Bank of England governor. Norman godfathered one of Sack's grandchildren. The money for this hideous criminal regime came from unexpected sources. In 1938, Hitler and Nazis received a spinning ball from the largest Austrian bank, Credit Anstalt, led by Louis Nathaniel von Rothschild. He risked to remain in Austria until Nazi occupation and eventually was arrested. Apart from the bank Nazis, his relatives from the rest of Europe paid the Nazis several millions of dollars for his release. Maybe it was just a coincidence given the massive support from the big industry, but this looks a lot like a sponsorship. His remaining in Austria, one was about to be occupied by the anti-Semitist Nazi that publicly initiated the Jewish hunt, looks like a very amateur decision. He supposed low level of anticipation of the political events is much under the possible of a banker with a long family tradition. The telecommunications company International Telephone and Telegraph IDT equipped the German army with telephones, radar devices, alarm systems, bomb ingredients, and many more. The IBM also has supported Nazi Germany in centralizing the Jewish data using the best technology at that time, the precursor of today's databases. In this image, you can see the IBM founder Thomas G. Watson alongside with Hitler. It's worth mentioning that IBM continued to work with Nazi Germany even after the US entered the war against it. Apple Company was directly involved in the construction of German war machine in the World War II. It has been owned since 1929 until 2017 by the US General Motors automobile concern, providing American automobile and big machinery technology that was more advanced at that time than that of Europe's. In addition to these deceitful gifts from the US big industrialists, Certain American spies were infiltrated into German military system. Most of them are still unknown today, but one of them was unlucky enough to be unveiled. His name was Reinhard Kechler, 
He was infiltrated in the German Foreign Espionage Service during Hitler's time as a major general. He was implicated in the 1944 assassination attempt on Hitler, who directly fired him right after that. The connection between him and the American espionage was so big that CIA later published a disinforming book about him, portraying their action of infiltration as one of heroism. After such a backup from the United States, Hitler behaved like already won a war with the entire Europe. His nationalistic ambitions of ruling over a vast empire were justified by taking back what Germany lost after the World War I, and most of German ultranationalists supported his plans. The 1929 economical crash turned many into supporting ultranationalistic political views, so after several years of war preparation, an invasion of a foreign country and a big world war were imminent. These are the most documented connections between the United States industrialists and creating the Nazi Germany. Those data accidentally leaked out of the global espionage classification control into public space. There are thousands of wrong or insufficient proven allegations on the US politicians and companies. That is very probably the civil espionage disinformation process that tried to minimize the dimension of the social engineering horrible landscape that the Second World War is dealing and supporting wars. But behind this, there must be thousands and thousands of classified documents that will probably never be published. However, after all the above, we can assume that everything connected with Rockefeller Morgan and the entire US banking system was in charge in supporting Nazi Germany for the pointing at the blame for the World War II humanitarian catastrophe of boosting the global economy. But right after the invasion of Poland, everything turned around from the United States. After helped Hitler and Nazi Germany to build the war machine that created chaos in Europe, most of the US support then suddenly changed into criticism and provocative acts. The pattern is exactly the Fritz Thyssen's fake psychological inconsistency, simulating the indignation for Hitler's war starting, although he was the main channel for building it. The Japan's traditional social organization was another business barrier in front of maximum profit. From the 19th century, in Japan started to develop a small industrial community, later called Zaibasu. They were the successors of the traders who have exchanged products with the Westerners since the 17th century. This class included the industrial groups like Mitsui, Nissan, Mitsubishi, or Matsushita Electric Industrial Company, that later was renamed Panasonic. These groups were dominating the industrial landscape throughout entire Asia. But before the World War II, Japan was mainly a traditionalist country, shaped under three major social classes, the aristocracy, the army, and the peasants. The Japanese ultranationalists put Japan and Japanese culture before any other nation. They believed that the Japanese spirit was superior to all the races and nations on earth. The industrialists made their way to prosperity among these three classes just right after the global industrial revolution. Due to their family tradition, Zaibasus had an open liberal progressive business-based ideology that didn't care much on Japanese nationalism but on their own profit. Step by step, Zaibasu became an important class, attracting envy from both the samurais and the aristocracy. The old samurai culture was very active in the Japanese imperial army. They did not see with good eyes the progressive globalizing mentality proposed by Zaibasu's industrial interests. The conflict between the two mentalities intensified, leading to the so-called League of Blood incident in 1932, 
several such ultranationalists launched a series of attacks against those labeled as Zaibasa, including a failed coup d'etat. In February, the progressive-minded politician Juno Suki in a way was assassinated. Next month, the general manager of the Mitsui group, Takuma Dan, was also killed. The same fate had the Prime Minister of Japan, Inukai Tsuyoshi, assassinated in that coup in May. This was the moment when Zaibas liberal industrialists called for U.S. metal oligarchy to help. The U.S. richest industrialists have maintained connections with the big Japanese industrial group owners through a vast communication network. The plan was making a war in order to eliminate the ultranationalists for both protecting the Saibasu and giving a boost to the Japan and world economy as well. After several generations of rich traders, the big Japanese industrialists understood that their profit can grow higher if a war was created, so collaborated with their partners from the United States in instilling it. So, instead of continuing the struggle with the ultranationalists, Zaibasu suddenly acted like ultranationalists themselves, no matter how improper that was to their natural industrial liberal mentality. The purpose was to attract others in the war and thus eliminate them from the Japan's public life and history. The war was not planned only for the ultranationalists, but also for the traditionalist peasants of the nation that were working in agriculture. The general plan was to convert them into the industrialist Western workers in the Japanese factories. After the World War II, Japan became an almost exclusively industrial country, and the plan worked just perfectly. So the United States' interest in supporting the progressive ideology in Japan against the traditionalists and ultranationalists has materialized in the plan of a war in a packet with the Europe War. All of the sudden, between the United States and Japan, there started tensions, although there were no natural interest to fight for. The United States and Japan were located at the opposite sides of the world and the only contact was made through trades with the Japanese industrial community. In 1929, Japan was the second country from which the United States imported products with a total value of $270,872,000. Any kind of disagreement could be solved by price negotiations, like these people usually do. The Japanese industrial community already had from the very beginning an open liberal progressive global ideology as they made commercial exchanges from the very 19th century. So the United States literal accusations on the only Japanese contact they had were totally pointless. But it makes sense if the actual target was not Saibasu, but the ultranationalists and the Japanese peasants. However, this plan worked on just fine, and the Japanese ultranationalists were caught in this trap. Firstly, in the US press appeared hostile articles towards Japan. The entire Japan immigrants were absolutely accused in the American mass media of being Japanese spies although the common people cannot do such a job. Then, the United States stopped the supply of oil and steel to this country, thus subjecting it to an economic embargo. We notice here the same instigation technique as the 1929 economic crash was for the Western antisemitism explosion in Europe. Basically, they forced Japan to find oil elsewhere, so the Japanese started conquering wars in the area for raw materials needed for their industry. On the other hand, the Japanese media, controlled by the big industrialists, as well in Japan as everywhere else, disinformed the people about the real power that the United States had at that time. The common people were systematically lied that Japan was the number one country in the globe and will smash the United States as it did with Russia before. The American people were portrayed as alcoholic and gamble addictive, 
that had no thought of the glory of the ancestors. The Japanese espionage agents intentionally gave this false data just to instigate people as much as possible into support in the war. They knew very well that the US is much better military equipped and an armed conflict was a losing decision. And yet, from their positions, they offered false data that inflated the Japanese nationalism appetite into war. This was a general civil espionage disinformation technique of infiltrating the agents into a movement for instilling it into doing unacceptable actions for general population or for associating it with a negative idea or image so that later on will be repudiated by the public opinion. This technique has been constantly used until nowadays for controlling the mass peaceful protests. Several diversions agents are infiltrated among the protesters and start to destroy the urban furniture for apparently no reason. But this strange action then justifies the authorities' brutal intervention on all the street protesters, especially the peaceful ones, and spread them off, as I pointed out in detail in my previous documentary, The Diversionists. This mass manipulation technique was used on the global scale in the Japanese society. The Zaibasu industrialists only simulated the nationalist mentality, just like the infiltrated diversionist agents simulate the protesters' mentality. The Japanese industrialists disguised themselves as nationalists and instigated the Japanese anti-American nationalists to start the war, thus satisfying the worldwide industrialist meta-oligarchy hunger for profit out of it. If you look at the way Tokyo looked after the war, we noticed that the US intensive bombardment strategically bypassed the commercial, industrial and business center of the town, as you can see in these pictures. The Imperial Palace was not touched at all. The bombs rather targeted the civilians from the marginalized neighborhoods. These were simply erased from the surface of the earth according to the plan of destroying the peasants and turning Japan into a fully industrialized country. This was the case of NATO bombing an ethnic Albanian civilian's convoy in Kosovo over 60 years later on May 14, 1999 in Korisha. 86 civilians were killed and 60 injured as a result of this attack. In the beginning, it was meant to be pointed on the back of Yugoslav People Army controlled by the Serbs and denigrate the entire Serbian nation in the world's public eyes. NATO first accused Serbia of committing these atrocities. This is a huge anti-humanitarian juggernaut put together by President Milosevic and his military and police leaders, and it's designed to change the demographics of Kosovo. Yes, but what's happening is because you are, bum who you no, are bombing no, today. No. That's, that's not what's happening at all. It's, it's this a was a plan. No, no, it's not a consequence. It's the opposite. It was only the Serbians' ability to prove the contrary. Otherwise, in the history books, we would remain with the information that this was a crime made by the Serbs. This event was eventually recognized by NATO as a regrettable mistake. And I'd like to add my condolences to the families of those whose lives were lost during the wars of the 90s, including as a result of the NATO air campaign in terms of responsibility. According to a Human Rights Watch report, 528 civilians lost their lives by accident during the NATO bombing in Serbia. Many others remained in history as done by the Serbs. Unfortunately, Serbia wasn't able to prove that the 1991 ambush on the Croatian militiamen near Borov Selo from the Serb-Croatian border area, neither that from the August 28, 1994 in the Markole Square from Sarajevo, and many others were actually done by different Western groups. 
but a Yugoslav People's Army accidentally shot down a USAF RQ-1 Predator drone on August 11, 1995, so you can figure out who were behind those attacks. These events escalated into the Serb-Croatian and Serb-Bosnian wars just like the World War II. The similarity of sudden forgetting and forgiving the catastrophe instigators was the same for Pacific War as it was for Fries, Thyssen, Hammarsack and Wilhelm Kepler in giving the power to Nazis in Germany. As in the case of German Nazi big financially supported convictions in the International Military Tribunal for Far East IMTFE, there were also some bizarre acquittals and decisions. Those were criminals who weren't involved in the American and Japanese espionage instigation group were convicted to many years in prison or even death by hanging, as all the crimes were pointed at. But the big instigators that also committed big crimes either managed to avoid prison or were imprisoned by a very short time. The same thing happened in the late 20th century with the 1990s Yugoslavian wars instigators Jovica Stanisic or Franko Simatovic, both publicly backed up by the CIA. The same thing happened with a huge number of Rwanda genocide main instigators. Some never went behind bars and others went there just for a very short period of time. Later. After the Pacific War ended, many local voices called for the dissolution of Zaibatsu, precisely for the role they played in the instigation of the war. Nevertheless, the US official objected, as Zaibatsu had been their ally for the destruction of traditional and nationalist Japan. The Mitsubishi Group has become the leading supplier of tanks and aircrafts for the Japanese Imperial Army. It has been involved in a vast state trafficking operation of powerful drugs such as opium and heroin for both archipelago and Japanese occupied territories in China and Manchuria. Virtually, the Japanese soldier Sober Mind was replaced by such a hostile and vicious propaganda against the United States. Nothing happened with Mitsubishi after the war, just like nothing happened with the German machinery engine suppliers Opel, owned by the General Motors company. Not only that many Japanese war criminals went away with mass murder, but later many of them became pillars of Japanese capitalism after the war ended. They were not punished because they were actually rewarded for their services of boosting the global economy. After the war ended, some Japanese war criminals were not only rehabilitated, but even put in the key positions in the intelligence departments. One of them was Torashiro Kawabe, Lieutenant General in the Japanese Army and Chief of the Kwantung Army Intelligence. After 1945, he was appointed as deputy chief in the Imperial Japanese Army General Staff. His brother, Masakatsu Kawabe, was arrested and then charged at the end of the war for war crimes, but by the same miracle he escaped from prison. A special case was Nobusuke Kishi, also known as the Devil of Shua a friend of the American ambassador in Tokyo, Joseph C. Grew. Kishi was arrested after the war for brutalities committed in Manchuria and China. After three years in prison, he was released. Between 1957 and 1960, he became the Prime Minister of Japan. In 1979, he received the United Nations Peace Medal. His grandson was the 2000s Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Another interesting story is that of Masanobu Tsuji, an officer in the Japanese army and later a politician. Having a very aggressive war strategy, 
He was one of the main supporters of the war against the United States. He took part in the numerous massacres committed by the Japanese army, for which he was never convicted by the IMTFE. He had connections with the Major General Charles A. Willoughby, the head of the G2 Military Intelligence Service. Tsuji was rehabilitated right after the war, being elected twice in the Japanese parliament. In 1961, he disappeared without a trace on his way to Laos. The head of the foreign ministry's intelligence during the war, A.G. Amo, was arrested but never convicted. Yoshishuki Aikawa, the founder of Nissan Group, which played a decisive role in Japan's war machine, was first arrested and then released by IMTFE. The so-called ultranationalist Yoshio Kodama made an immense fortune from drug trafficking during the war. After 1945, he was arrested for a short time and never convicted, still working with the American intelligence community in Asia in various operations, such as smuggling tungsten from China in 1949. The ultranationalist Ryorishi Sasakawa became rich with rice speculum during the Sino-Japanese War of 1930. He was the Patriotic People's Party leader before the war, one of the political factions that instigated the war against the United States. Due to the instigating activities, he was arrested in 1935, being released at the beginning of the war. He created paramilitary war units. He befriended Yoshio Kodama in prison. After the war, he created Japanese casinos and gambling industry. The finance minister Okinori Kaya was charged and convicted for the war crimes by the IMTFE for 20 years in prison. In 1955, he was released and later was elected to the Japanese parliament in 1958 as later CIA openly admitted collaboration with him. In 1963, Kaia became the Minister of Justice in Japan. These are just few names from a longer list of no convicted and immediately or later acquitted criminals that trashed Japan into that horrible world. A special case is the Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. He was the initiator idea of the Pearl Harbor attack, unspecific to his education and way of thinking. He studied from 1919 to 1921 at Harvard University. He was fascinated by the President Lincoln's image and learned English from his readings. In 1926, he was appointed as a naval attaché to the Japanese embassy in Washington. He adopted the American strategic games like poker and bridge, or the physical ones like billiard and baseball. He practiced them throughout his entire life and became very skilled on. Yamamoto was very much influenced by the American culture, especially the globalist, anti-nationalist mentality. He had a noble spirit based on honor and respect he was a very compassionate person and suffered when others were hurt. He opposed the war with Russia and China. Moreover, he first openly opposed the war with the United States as the Japan's alliance with Nazi Germany. It was only later that he suddenly changed his mind. He was eventually convinced that this was the only way to get rid of the Japanese ultranationalists who kept harassing him for his peaceful political views. Because of his good relationships with the West, especially with the United States, and his opposition to the Japan's expansion plans, Yamamoto received much criticism from colleagues in the military as well as threats from the Japanese nationalists. In 1938, he kept receiving death threats in mail and later there were ultranationalist mob demonstrations in front of his house. 
In his book The Reluctant Admiral Yamamoto and the Imperial Navy at page 167, Hiroyuki Agawa narrated about arresting a man with a load of dynamite meant to blow up Yamamoto's house. In 1939, he had to be replaced from the Vice Minister of the Navy and appointed as commander in the Chief of the Combined Fleet in order to relocate him away from his current home so to avoid a possible assassination. And all of a sudden, he came with this crazy idea to launch an attack over the American base in Pearl Harbor. This sudden switch of radical position toward a situation is another kind of psychological fake inconsistency that Yamamoto simulated just like the American support for the Nazi Germany that suddenly changed into an opposition. Let's remember Fritz Thyssen, who financed the Nazis' war machine when they were weak and then criticized them when the war started. This sudden change in attitude and behavior was crucial for Yamamoto's life in the context that the ultranationalists around him were so eager for war. The idea of the Pearl Harbor attack without any initial declaration of war does not make any sense in respect to his personal beliefs and military honor. It was a cowardly surprise action with not giving the adversary the chance to defend. That was not only unspecific to Yamamoto's mentality, that was unspecific to the samurai honor and Japanese military honor in general. No traditional Japanese person would have done it. That's why the Pearl Harbor attack attracted a lot of speculations during the post-war period. It was the weakest point of the World War II instigation plan with a specific Western mentality operation but never specific to the Japanese culture, not even for the Zaibatsu's industrialists' liberal mentality. The war engineers only cared to justify the United States entering the war against Japan in the international public opinion's eyes, especially the Americans but it pathetically failed to coherently adjust it to the Japanese culture, mentality and behavior. Yamamoto's special strategic abilities gave him clear clues from the very beginning that a surprise attack on another country without any warning would attract international hostility and produce a military response from the United States. Such an action not only that was not successful in convincing the United States to give up the economic embargo over Japan, but also has drawn it into a bloody war. However, the Pearl Harbor attack social engineer was the most effective plan to get off the situation that the Japanese industrialists and Yamamoto himself were facing about the xenophobe ultranationalists. This plan did not represent the way he thought, but he was probably told that the war was the only way to get rid of the ultranationalist danger in Japan. He simulated to come up with this plan, but it was actually built in the big industrialists and bankers disinformation laboratories. Yamamoto maintained close relations with the various American espionage agents and was persuaded together with the Zaibatsu industrialists to propose such a plan of long-term gathering of his ultranationalist enemies. His plan was so anti-American that surprised even the most radical Japanese nationalists. After taking the responsibility for it, Yamamoto's image as patriot among nationalists was restored. From this position, he played the role of war instigator. Officially, we're told that he was killed on April 18, 1943 by a complex US military operation, which has remained in history under the name of Operation Vengeance. It is said that the US espionage decoded some Japanese messages in the Pacific about a trip that Yamamoto was going to fly. 
So 18 American pilots and several planes ambushed and eventually shot down the plane he was flying in. This operation could have been done either because he was not happy with the war evolving or because he wanted out of it. As the war was prolonged and many Japanese people, other than the nationalists, kept losing their lives, he probably put pressure on the war pillars to end it as quick as possible. His character didn't cope with such a big war that was developed in the Pacific. So Iter's Ibasu double agents betrayed him to the Americans and he was killed or he was safely extracted and given another identity and another life and replaced with another body. The Operation Vengeance is another psychological fake inconsistency from the US Army and espionage. We previously saw how huge Japanese war criminals were acquitted, not convicted or even released from prison long before punishment time by the International Military Tribunal for Far East. Yamamoto was probably the US biggest ally, worldwide known after declarations, habits and personal mentality. On the other hand, Yamamoto's death during the war was unique in modern wars. He was the commander-in-chief of the Japan Combined Fleet and the best Japanese commander. His rank in this war was the same with that of Churchill's, Hitler's or Stalin's. No other such important commander was captured or killed during last century confrontations, and that aroused many speculations about this event. That is very strange considering his strategic abilities. How is possible to protect Yamamoto in 1939 from the ultranationalist death threats by sending him in a battle in 1943, just like an ordinary soldier and risk his life? It doesn't make any sense. Besides that, the real vengeance would be catching him alive, publicly humiliating and convicting him in a tribunal after the war was over. This operation might not exactly have been a vengeance gesture, but an act of securing the big war plan. Focusing on the Admiral Yamamoto psychological profile, we can deduce that his consent to Pearl Harbor attack responsibility was only for a small war, instigated only to eliminate the ultranationalists that kept threatening him for his peaceful position. Yamamoto was thus very probably cunningly manipulated by his allies from behind the curtain. He probably agreed for a short work of one or two years. But both the Japanese and the US big industrialists were aimed at the poor and the peasants' eradication as well. They had a bigger war instilling in their minds. So, one year later, when the war grew bigger, instead of ending, as he was probably told, he very probably might have felt that he was deceived. Seeing the innocent poor and peasants dying with hundreds of thousands it could have troubled him. This is the moment when probably he asked the war pillar's instigation group to end it as soon as possible. To avoid any risk from him complaining about the instigation plan, he was then sent into an ambuscade and taken down as we know. Also, he could have been killed first and then his dead body put into this bomber to make it look like he was shot down by the enemy. The second scenario is that he could have turned into a target, this time for the Japanese moderate officers who might have started to blame him for the disastrous war that was taking place in Japan. His Pearl Harbor attack plan drew a negative spot over the Japanese Imperial Army honor. The imminence of losing the war could have had a negative impact on his image into the army. So there is a certain probability that the Operation Vengeance was in fact an extraction operation and saving his life as was the Fritz Thyssen's sudden change in boats from financially supporting Nazi Germany to criticizing the invasion of Poland.
The conditions for creating a world war were ready as it started in Europe. But there was still a problem left. The American public opinion was against the idea of U.S. entering the war. If it couldn't reach the United States, then the American anti-capitalists remained untouched. But with the war, every American anti-capitalist would look like a traitor in the public opinion's eyes, like every British or French anti-capitalist. So the United States had to enter the war with any price. The social engineers won a subtle manipulation campaign to change the public opinion perception about entering the war, and that was the Pearl Harbor attack itself. It made America look like it's under attack, and the war looked like a defensive, justifiable one. After this, the American public opinion supported entering the war both in Pacific as in Europe. The Pearl Harbor attack was organized by the American and the Japanese big industrialists in the exact way of supporting the Nazis gain the power in Germany. That is why the information sent by Private Joseph Lockhart to Lieutenant Kerman Tyler was ignored on that Sunday morning of December 7, 1941. Everything was carefully planned. If this information came out and alerted the crew, the damage could be smaller and produced not enough emotion in the American public opinion to sustain this war. The Pearl Harbor attack was in such a way organized so the American public opinion supported the war in both Europe and Pacific. Based on this support, the anti-capitalists would be smashed and the peasants sent away from their lands into the industrialists' factories. We previously saw how the Japanese and the American big industrialists collaborated for creating the Pearl Harbor attack. The main problem was attracting Germany and this as well. The history books lie about the cause of war as a response to President Hitler's war declaration on the United States. But the truth is far from that. As already described, after secretly supporting him and Nazi party to build his war machine, the United States suddenly switched sides right after the Nazi invaded Poland in September 1, 1939. Two days after, the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. Soon after that, the United States Navy started a harassing campaign, hoping for a response from Nazi Germany, so make it look like it started the war in the international public opinion eyes. The US warships started harassing the German fleet that was already in war with the United Kingdom. An example is the SS Columbus civilian ship incident with 411 civilians on board chased by the British Royal Navy in December 19, 1939. The American military ship Tuscaloosa intervened and assisted the civilians capture and then sank the Columbus. The German warships were pushed by the US Navy to be intercepted by the British Royal Navy in January 1941. On November 6, the US Navy captured the German ship Odewald near the St. Peter and St. Paul archipelago in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, taking prisoners the entire ship crew. Iceland was a strategic point of interest for Germany at the beginning of the war. It was occupied by United Kingdom on May 10, 1940, and then was surrendered to United States in July 7, 1941. So although officially the United States was a neutral country at that time, in fact it was clearly involved in the war on the United Kingdom's side as constantly harassing German ships in the Atlantic. The United States was expecting a response from Germany, so to be used as an excuse to the American public opinion of justifying the Germany's and Japan's as defensive wars. 
This is exactly what happened with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan after 9-11-2001 attack on the World Trade Center. But despite its falsely diagnosed paranoia in the history books, Hitler was unwilling to open another war with the United States. He knew very well that the United States has the most powerful army in the world, as Germany was indeed helped by them to achieve its war machine. So Hitler carefully avoided a war with this country and didn't fall into a response to American harassment. Before the American War Declaration on Germany, the Germans only defended when were attacked, but not replied with a kind of Pearl Harbor attack. So the plan worked perfectly for the public opinion, except this only one small detail that was not fulfilled, namely the Germany's fictions declaration of war against the United States. Despite the challenges that the US military has instigated for almost two years in the Atlantic, this declaration still did not come. The history falsifiers lied about this. But in two years of war, Germany had not made any declaration of war to any country, as it simply attacked without a preliminary statement. How come Germany have had started a war declaration to the United States only? Some sources say that Hitler's speech in the German Reichstag, made on December 11, 1941, should be taken enough as a declaration of war against the United States. But this is simply empty words demagogy that works for untrained people. Even if his speech would be interpreted as offensive to the United States, still it wouldn't be held for a genuine war declaration within the international law. Such a document should have had been sent to an American official. But knowing its hostile actions against Germany, the United States previously withdrew its ambassador. So this presumptive document could not be possibly handed to such an official. There are other lying sources that claim that this declaration of war was personally handed by the Germany's foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop to US diplomat Leland B. Morris who served as an official ambassador. But how come such document is not publicly exposed? Nobody saw it. We can see the Canadian declaration of war on Germany, or the United States declaration of war against Japan, against Germany and other states. But there is no declaration of war from Germany against the United States. The channel history through its related website says, quoting, so, at 3.30 p.m. Berlin time, on December 11th, the German Charged Affairs in Washington handed American Secretary of State Cordell Hall a copy of the Declaration of War." End quote. That's just another lie. In fact, the story of Germany's Declaration of War against the United States is an attempt to falsify the history, which remains to this day. It follows a whole host of provocative instigation to attract a German attack on the United States and thus to justify starting a war against Germany to the international public opinion. This is how the Chicago High Market affair was done in 1886 as well as the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this is how the instigations are particularly done by the espionage diversionists. In fact, it was the United States that declared war on Germany on December 11, 1941, and not the other way around. This alleged Germany's declaration of war against the United States did not come even after the United States declared war on Germany. The meta-oligarchy social engineers relied on the fact that the world was no longer paying attention to such details as was very shocked by the Pearl Harbor attack enough to believe such a historical lie. 
The interest in falsifying the Germany's declaration of war against the USA was meant to hide the main purpose of justifying starting this war, namely the economic profit interest for typical boosting the economy. Such an interest, together with the worldwide richest industrialist of supporting Hitler's ascension to power, offered another one to blame for the huge drama caused by the international meta-oligarchy in Europe and Japan, namely the social Spartanism of eugenics on the people's behalf. This lie was embedded in the history precisely to conceal the true meaning of the World War II, hiding these truths from the public opinion and mystifying this information was actually a global-scale disinformation made by the richest industrialists and bankers. Giving the power to the anti-Semitists so to instill a war was meant to sacrifice the Jewish people. The Jewish Holocaust drama tried to restore the Rothschild banker's dynasty bad image into international compassion and step up the profit some more. Just like in advertising, the success of a social engineering eventually works with a better public campaign. As Hitler didn't fall into the trap of naval harassment, the worldwide industrialists started a plan of making him look like he declared such a war to the United States in the public opinion eyes. So the big industrialists came with building a plan to make a disinformation association between Nazi Germany and the Japan Empire, no matter how impossible it might have been in reality. Firstly, Hitler was racist and didn't seem to enjoy relations with the Asian race Japan. Secondly, the Japanese nationalists believed that Japan was the number one nation on earth as their emperor was the son of God. However, Japan accepted a smaller status and took the initiative to come closer to Nazi Germany for a virtual impossible international cooperation. Because thirdly, a pact between these two countries, located in the other side of the world, was almost impossible to function at that time. Only the United States were able of sending armies so far. Hitler didn't pay much attention to it at first, but eventually saw a chance to use what seemed to be a Japanese naivety in the European wars that he was planning. The way this association was created is very interesting. On November 25, 1936, the Japan Empire signed a fictive anti-communist treaty with Germany called the Anti-Comintern Pact. This treaty has another psychological effect in consistency as those previously described. Why the Japan Empire didn't sign the same treaty with the United Kingdom as well? The answer is very easy now. Because the plan was that the war in Europe would happen between the Germany and United Kingdom. Later, when it really began, wouldn't look good in the public opinion an alliance between Japan and UK. Japan and Germany should have had been perceived as monsters, as the United States and United Kingdom as the world saviors. On the other hand, the communism was virtually unknown in Japan, as already easily won the war against the communist Russia. Why make a world alliance against the world communist, since you as a country don't have problems with the communism? Well, it doesn't make any sense for the declared intentions, but has a lot of sense in the international public opinion mental association between the Japan Empire and Nazi Germany. The anti comintern pact was not even attended by Hitler and left behind no clear record. He was not interested in the war on the other side of the world and remained like that. So there came another treaty, right after the United States switching sides and starting harassing German ships in the Atlantic Ocean. Its name was the Tripartite Pact, 
and was signed in September 27, 1940. This time Mussolini's Italy was taking part in it. As Hitler respected Mussolini, he was also present at the signing formalities. After Germany, Italy and Japan signed this treaty, other countries joined it. But its main purpose, followed by Japan's delegation, was never reached, as it was near impossible. The shape of Article 3 from this pact has something unusual. It says, quoting, Germany, Italy and Japan agree to assist one another with all political, economic and military means when one of the three contracting powers is attacked by a power at present not involved in the European war or in the Chinese-Japanese conflict. And quoting. Why this article is not simpler? Why didn't it just simply say what we are led to believe by history falsifiers, namely that Germany, Italy and Japan agreed to assist one another when one of them is attacked like today's NATO cooperation works? Well, that was probably because Hitler refused to enter a war with China that Japan fought against that time. To imagine that a country in war on many fronts in Europe like Germany can afford to relocate a part of its army in the other side of the world was pretty unrealistic. And every practical person would do the same under those conditions, except for Japan that acted like involving in that strange obligation. This Article 3 from the Tripartite Pact was near impossible to put in practice concerning Japan. After Pearl Harbor attack that attracted USA war declaration over Japan, Hitler declined the conditions in this treaty and didn't send anything to help Japan in this war. So, when the Japanese delegation proposed this article in a simple form, he probably saw them as a bunch of dreamers. However, he agreed to participate alongside with Japan in a war against Russia. The Caucasian rich oil fields were very tempting to his conquering ambitions. On the other hand, he thought that Japan could be used in a possible war against the United States right there in Europe. So he probably was the one who put that condition in that three article. But Hitler never imagined the emergence of the Pacific War, except the American newspapers that saw this tripartite pact as a plan of Japan, Germany and Italy to attack the United States. But still the history books tell us that the Pearl Harbor American base was taken by surprise. Well, the tripartite pact was meant exactly for this connection point that the United States spies manipulated Yamamoto to assume the attack on Pearl Harbor. They hoped that Hitler would follow the tripartite pact collaboration that was previously signed. The Pacific War was something new in the history. It was the first time when a country went to the other side of the world to start a war there. The Pearl Harbor attack was so surprising that Hitler waited four days to react, thinking of keeping or ignoring that promise stipulated in the Article 3 of the Three-Party Pact. Eventually, after four days, he declined declaring war on USA but justified the Japanese attack by a response to the USA harassment. The plan of attracting Nazi Germany into declaring war on the USA was very ingenious, but still had its cracks. As already mentioned, in the speech delivered on December 11, 1941, in the German Reichstag, four days after the Pearl Harbor attack, Hitler only accused the United States of instigating Japan but not made a declaration of war. Towards the end of the speech, Hitler only stated that, quoting, nobody would attack America unless Americans provoked the attack, end quote. In fact, Hitler's speech warns that Germany will respond every time when attacked. The plan was perfect if Nazi Germany would have been written a war declaration and the entire guilt for the humanitarian catastrophe that followed is put on the Nazi Germany's and Japan's shoulders. 
But after all, the tripartite pact did its job of attracting Nazi Germany in association with Japan and convincing the international opinion that Hitler was somehow involved in the Pearl Harbor attack. So, even that his speech was not enough to be taken as a war declaration, as history books lie, with a good disinformation campaign, the big worldwide industrialists made it look like one. Hitler was eventually perceived by the international public opinion as declaring war to the United States. He was perceived as aggressor and United States looked like only responded to Germany's and Japan's invasion for its defense. With the tripartite pact, Hitler thought he outsmarted the Japanese delegation to make Japan work for him. But he was caught in a bigger disinformation trap that he could have not possibly imagined. Behind that delegation, there was the American richest industrial espionage, far from his abilities of understanding. The US agents from the Japanese system managed to grab the agreement from Germany that if one of the three countries were attacked, the others would declare war on the attacker. Such a diversionary strategy, typical of worldwide meta-oligarchy, social engineering, was meant to convince the American and the international public opinion that the US would fight a defensive war. After the Pearl Harbor attack, the American public opinion overwhelmingly favored United States' entry into the war with both Japan and Germany. The official propaganda has taken care to associate the two countries as much as possible with each other. The industrialists were rubbing their hands because, as previously mentioned, an economic growth skyrocketing was on the horizon from the threats that the workers perceived as to their own lives, like the classical slavery case. The World War II instigation leaks came eventually up because they were meant to convince the general population from the United States and Japan to enter the war. All those information were published by Hanus people that accidentally found it. There must be many other evidence on the entire US huge industrialist economic tools that supported Hitler and Nazi to gain power in Germany but eventually they were totally erased from the history. Now it's time to understand the First World War in the same light as the Second one. The main difference from the World War II is that at the beginning of 20th century, the Europe was much less a democratic region than the United States. The power was much more concentrated in the hands of the politicians and the industrialists than in the people's hands. There was no main interest to convince people to enter the war, but the politicians. Due to the factories hard working conditions at that time, in many workers' minds arose the old mercenary job of joining the armies. For today's Western way of life, it is near impossible to judge the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century urban life frustrations. The war was a mental lottery regression for most of the working class people for a better life. It was theoretically admitted one century before by the German philosopher Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel who stated the necessity of the war in order to spread off the local frustrations out on other nations than one's own nation. He observed the situation of Louis XVI, who was a soft king but ended be hated by the French Revolution exactly because he was not able to make wars and convert out there the people's frustration instead of its own state. Apart from that, the big European industrialists and bankers knew that wars bring profit from the very economic experience they had. Instead of giving better working conditions for the workers and easier lives, the big European industrialists instigated this World War I. 
If no war was created between the nations, then the worker strikes will function as the war between the same nation. Besides this general interest of instilling war between the nations, there was a particular interest in punishing Germany for its anti-Semitist political orientation exactly like the World War II. As previously stated, under that anti-Semitism was hiding the anti-19th century banking system while capitalist. The Rothschild dynasty was first pointed at. The Rothschild tweaks into the European politicians and kings of the 19th and the 20th century first health are notorious. They continued until today, but were better hide from the public opinion. The strongest Rothschild's connections with the power factors from the European countries were in Britain. The links between the Rothschild dynasty and Britain decision makers are recognized by the family's archives itself. One of Meyer Amschel Rothschild's sons, Nathan, laid the foundation of the British branch of the Rothschild dynasty. Between 1865 and 1885, he was a member of the House of Commons. One of Nathan's sons, Anthony Nathan de Rothschild, was recognized as Baron de Rothschild on June 16, 1838, by Queen Victoria herself by a special converting noble title decree from the von Rothschild obtained in Austria. Nathan's other son, Lionel de Rothschild, had business and friendship with Benjamin Disraeli, who served as Prime Minister of Great Britain from 1874 to 1880. Apart from this period, Disraeli obtained various financial benefits from Rothschild. His eldest son, Nathaniel Meyer Rothschild, continued his friendship with Disraeli and in 1884 became a member of the House of Lords with the support of that time Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone, who also gave him a nobleman title. Archibald Primrose married Hannah de Rothschild, daughter of Baron Meyer de Rothschild, on March 20, 1878, and right after he entered politics. In 1894 he became Prime Minister. One of his children was Niall Primrose, who served as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs in the Herbert Henry Askett Cabinet, that was in charge from 1908 to 1916 during the war. Before being Prime Minister, Askett was Secretary of State in the Domestic Department in the 1894 Primrose Cabinet, strongly supporting him. Randolph Churchill, the father of the famous Winston Churchill, was a childhood friend of Nathaniel Rothschild, another Nathan's son. In addition to his friendship, Randolph was practically Nathaniel Rothschild's employee working for him inside and outside the UK in banking and mining businesses. Before becoming Prime Minister during the World War II, Winston Churchill was appointed under Secretary of State for the Colonies in 1905. On February 14, 1910, he was appointed Secretary of State for the House of Commons in the Herbert Henry Asquith Cabinet that was in charge of the World War I starting. The links between Rothschild and the Austrian leadership are as well recognized by the family archives. The Emperor Franz Joseph, who was the ultimate decision taker in 1914 in Austria when the war began, approved a civil servant post in Frankfurt for Wilhelm von Rothschild. When Wilhelm died on January 25, 1901, his post was granted to his son-in-law, Maximilian Goldsmith Rothschild, on August 11, same year who remained in the office until the Austro-Hungarian monarchy ended on November 12, 1918. On January 16, 1823, the Emperor Franz I of Austria appointed Nathan May Rothschild as General Honorary Consul in London. 
when Nathan Rothschild died on July 28, 1836, and this position was appointed his eldest son, Lionel Nathan Baron Rothschild. On February 16, 1876, the Emperor Franz Joseph appointed Alfred de Rothschild as his Consul General in London. He held the office until August 12, 1914, when the United Kingdom declared war on the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. The fact that these functions were inherited shows that they were somehow due to the Rothschild family and that not necessarily given to the presumptive Rothschild family members' expertise. This practice was the indication for its co-optation in those positions as a certain debt which was then transferred to these direct heirs. These functions were not wanted for remuneration, as the family was involved in banking businesses, but for political influence. These positions were basically bought and owned by the Rothschild family. These pillars pulled the strings behind the curtain to adopt a favorable legislation. The Emperor Franz first appointed James de Rothschild as Honorary Consul General in Paris on August 11, 1821, following the example of London and Frankfurt. After James's death on November 15, 1868, the Emperor Franz Joseph I appointed his son Gustav de Rothschild on this position on December 28, 1868, who kept it until his death on November 28, 1911. The French branch of the dynasty left many traces in the press or other documents. In his book The Rothschilds, History of the Familial Capitalism, Jean Bouvier says that French Prime Minister René Giuliani, when he was a Minister of Labor, amended the decree banning the use of mercury in the textile industry in France, thus protecting the Russian family's monopoly business. In 1908, the head of CGT Federation accused Giuliani of being quoting the Rothschild family accomplice, end quote. Gaston Dumais was Minister of the Colonies in the Viviani cabinet in 1914. Later, in 1924, he became President of France. In the same year, Dumer went to inaugurate the Art History Library at the Solomon Rothschild Foundation. Some French politicians have dropped out the Rothschild family, such as Jules Gaeta, a non-portfolio minister in the Viviani cabinet. In a June 17, 1886 article published in the Le Cri du Peuple magazine, he described Rothschild as, quoting, a bad Jew who had been living for nearly a century like a gigantic octopus in the heart of France from which he sucked the blood through all the suckers, end quoting. The anti-Rothschildism and anti-Semitism in France developed also with the left political views. The trade unionist and journalist Robert Luzon described French President Raymond Poincaré as the Rothschild servant in the number 114 from the February 15, 1931 of the magazine La Révolution Proletarienne. The image of the Rothschild family was so bad in France that the politician and journalist Georges Mandel, born Louis George Rothschild, unrelated to the Rothschild family, changed his name. Through these Europe-wide connections, the Rothschild dynasty and the other big industrialists and bankers pulled the strings for the World War I outbreak. Apart from their morbid attraction to instilling wars, the other interest was to make the entire Europe's business environment like it was in Britain. Their main target for destruction and economic disaster was Germany. That's why the First World War started out of almost nothing. The Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was murdered in Sarajevo on 28 June 1914 by a Bosnian Serb student. 
the Austro-Hungarian Empire demanded Serbia for several measures for stopping the Serbian resistance towards the Austro-Hungarian Empire dominance. Some of them were accepted, but others, mostly absurd, were refused. As a result, the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war to Serbia. In reply, Russia declared as well war to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Germany then gave Russia an ultimatum that implicitly turned into a war declaration after it expired. Then the most European countries entered the war one by one under a babyish justification, just like the American Civil War. Assassinations like that happened often in history and involved kings and presidents, but didn't lend it worse. The most famous of all is the US President John Fitzgerald Kennedy's assassination in November 22, 1963, pointed on the Soviet Union. The mainstream media assumed that the murderer was Lee Harvey Oswald, a US Marine veteran with the communist views. However, the United States not only that didn't start the war, but didn't even officially accuse the Soviet Union for this murder. It is true that the Oswald's narrative was mainly made to convince the American public opinion to point outside the US the guilt for this murder. However, murdering an official person is not a reason to murder another millions right after in a war. The Austro-Hungarian Empire's war to Serbia has a certain amount of justification for preventing future diplomats' assassinations. But involving other countries in it had not a natural explanation, as the wars were justified throughout history. The World War I was basically made out of the similar to World War II reasons. The first one is the need for terrorizing population that works harder and brings more profit to the employers. The second one is the social engineering Darwinism eugenics. The third purpose of this war was getting to Germany and punishing it for its anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism was a crime of accusing and punishing people not after their actions, but for their race. Correcting this crime through a bigger disaster punishment was one of the biggest mistakes in the history, as Germany became lesser than a decade even more anti-Semitistic. The World War II was the biggest humanitarian catastrophe in the history, trying again in the same way to correct this anti-Semitism. The World War II left behind 70 to 85 million people dead, among which only 21 to 25.5 million were military soldiers and officers. Instead of fighting one another with their war machineries, the armies used civil population as a target, thus creating social postnatal eugenics. Millions of peasants were killed Another hundred of millions were chased away from the lands in Europe and Japan to become factory workers. The World War I left behind 21 million casualties, but there are voices that claim they were up to 40 million. We know that more than 90% of American indigenous population was exterminated between 1492 and the end of the 19th century through direct wars or diseases spread from the Europeans. But we don't know exactly how big that population was. The anthropologist Russell Thornton, professor of anthropology at the University of California in Los Angeles, estimated that the total number of indigenous deaths throughout the Western Hemisphere during that time were about 175 million. If this number is correct, the American indigenous population genocide was mainly involuntarily made with naturally spread diseases. Besides that, it happened during several centuries. So the World War II was the biggest crime in history, as happened in several years. And all of this was planned just because the beginning of 20th century industrialists just didn't want to offer the workers good and decent lives out of greed. 
so the population came to support extremist views that eventually turned into social turmoil and these horrible wars. The wars that followed not only that didn't stop the extremism but made it even bigger. During the Second World War, the German population felt that Germany was again attracted into social disaster like in the World War I and supported Hitler even more than before the war. Apart from this catastrophe, another monstrosity exploded in the Eastern European nation, the communism. Its ideology led politicians and other market decide who to be in charge in a business which eventually turned into the economical stagnation. Besides that, ruling the society from the peasant's mentality became a dictatorship that eventually turned against all the people, not only the rich. To prevent a bigger humanitarian catastrophe like the post-First World War than they wanted to prevent, the big industrialists eventually came with the Marshall Plan of Reconstruction in Europe and something similar in Japan. They failed changing public opinion in supporting the wild capitalism, as both the Rothschild and Rockefeller dynasties members changed their names and were faded away from the public's opinion eyes. But they created and continue to create up to nowadays the social eugenics engineering by killing the weak in these horrible wars out of their insatiable need for profit. The big industrialists' appetite for blood is endless. The 20th century second half wars were not as horrible as these two world wars, but they continued. In 1960s, the Vietnam War was made to eliminate the weak population and sustain the wild capitalism. The 20,000 Iraqi war aimed to get the rich oil fields and destabilize the Middle East area that eventually expanded into the 2010 Syrian war. This war and the 1990s Yugoslav wars were made to keep the population deportation into western countries as the western population kept growing older and older. Same happened with the 1989 civil war attempt in my country, Romania. The 1994 Rwandan genocide was also an attempt of testing the African and Western people's vigilance in creating genocides around the big diamond area near Rwanda. The devastating effects of the war, especially the trauma of the two US launched nuclear bombs in Japan, on the one hand eventually turned into the most spectacular economical growth in history. But on the other hand, Japan had one of the highest rates of depressive disorders and suicides. Even today, this country can be proud for the low sexual appetite on both sexes. The statistics show that 34% of young Japanese people are all interested in video games, with no interest in sex and much less in marriage. The mental disorders in the Western countries exploded up to 80% of population. Besides boosting the global economy, these wars were perfect camouflage for a horrible mental disorder still not recognized by the medical authorities, the murderous sadism. It develops in the wealthy families during several generations, as I showed in detail in my documentary The International Politics Sadism. The murderous sadistic actions were perfectly merged with the economical interests into this horrible sexual disorder. The big industrialists' economical profit from humanitarian catastrophes eventually turned into the strange pleasure of killing women. The entire society's institutions are meant to cover these rich family sexual crimes. The words usually cover these monstrosities as well, but the danger of growing murderous studies under this maximum profit culture is huge. Within this trend, the human species will auto-exterminate itself within several centuries. The second half of the 20th century was marked by unprecedented economical development and technology evolution. The digital era is capable of totally eliminating mental stress and hard working, 
but the murder saddest families that gained power for centuries don't want to let it go. They present themselves as the base of the industrial revolution, but eventually became a trap and a barrier for social development, as they have interest in having people kept in poverty and misery. The society has to ask a serious question about what the human species will evolve into the future. We experience how the communist power equalization leads eventually to dictatorship, but on the other hand, giving unlimited power to some, as happened in the Western capitalists, leads to even tougher dictatorship. As long as in this world institutions like police, army, and espionage will exist, there will be humanitarian catastrophes. The stronger these institutions become, the more social eugenics will take place. The ideological disinformation keep lying to us about how these institutions are meant to protect us, but they are the modern human hunters and dream destroyers. Their cruel society is felt by most of the rest of us. The mental disorders and deep unhappiness are direct consequences of their horrible society painted in happy colors. But from the graves, the dead still cry out their sorrow. Thank you.